In 2011, Matt Dixon co-authored a book called The Challenger Sale. Most people know that that sent a seismic shockwave throughout the industry of sales, which came up with some really interesting research and some fascinating learnings that salespeople are using day to day across their processes and methodologies. I was really fortunate to sit down with Matt for 45 minutes and have a candid conversation around the history of the Challenger Sale, where he feels that sales is going, and also the reception of the book, how salespeople reacted to this new finding and this new way of selling. Before we dive in, remember to subscribe, remember to like and share across your networks. So let's dive in. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. And as I mentioned before, like I'm, I'm really excited about uh, interviewing you and, and learning more about the Challenger Cell, but more specifically about where it came from, the reaction to it, and, and obviously where it's going. The, the obvious question to start with, which I think is probably one that a lot of people will be excited to learn about, is talk to us about the history of the Challenger Cell, because from my understanding, there's stuff in there that people have probably been doing for a long time, but you managed to codify it and explain it and almost sort of put your finger on it. So it'd be good to understand where did it all come from and, 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 and a bit of, bit of the history, basically. Yeah, of course. Um, well, it's great to be with you, Aaron, and thanks for inviting me. Um, so the uh, I'll take you back to, um, uh, it was 2008, I think, when we uh, really started digging into this uh, research. So I guess I was Technically speaking, the last time the world fell apart um, until the until the most recent time the world fell apart. But um, you know, for for those of us who were selling in that environment, um, I think we can all remember how difficult it was. You know, in the height of the financial crisis, and we I was at the time um, uh, leading a research team at a company called CEB. CEB is, was acquired by Gardner Group in 2017. But um, one of the the practice areas I ran was in business to business sales, and so. In this environment, so our, our business model was we went out and uh, we um, provided subscription-based research to our clients. At the time, we worked with about 700 heads of sales around the world, uh, from you know mid-market, um, smaller enter uh, enterprises all the way up to large enterprises uh, globally, um, including many um, uh, many companies in Europe. And at the time, you can imagine that the the number one issue that heads of sales uh, were really struggling with was survival. Uh, at, you know, they were looking at uh, candidly, a bloodbath across our organization. Uh, their salespeople missing, uh, missing their quotas, missing their goals by a very wide margin. And you know, as we started to dig into, it, so they were they were looking to us um, as a research team to help them with some some data, some insight that might provide some sort of path or window into how we get out of this as a sales uh, community. Um, as we dug into it, what we found was there was um, this sort of uh, paradox in almost every sales organization we we encountered, and the paradox was this that you know, yes, by and large, the vast majority of sellers were missing their number by a, a very wide margin in that environment. But there were a set of sellers in every single company we, lo we looked at as we started kind of poking around who were continuing to bring in, um, not just hit their numbers, but exceed their numbers and bring in deals that those companies would have been excited to get in the best of times, but they were doing it in the, in the worst sales environment that any of them had ever encountered. And so there was this question about, what is it that they're doing that's different? Uh, how are they still managing to find success in this really um, terrible economy? And is there something we can learn from that and then export uh, to the rest of the um, uh, the sales organization? So you know, it really started as a study of basically selling in a tough environment. Um, what it evolved into over time was um, a, and I think what we what we uncovered was a way to sell to information empowered customers. It really. In some ways, the, the Great Recession, I'd argue the current environment too, is a bit of a head fake. So Challenger wasn't a story about just succeeding in a tough sales environment in an economic downturn. It was a story about how do you sell to customers who don't really need you anymore, who can find out everything about you, uh, your company, your products, your solutions on your website or on LinkedIn, right? Uh, and they don't get the same value from sales interactions that they once did. So it, it kind of what again was designed to be a study that was sort of a point in time thing. Let's help our clients get through this really tough environment. Took on a life of its own and ended up um, spinning off, uh, you know, a sequel book in multiple years of research. Because as we, you know, found answers as we started to dig into the the way that customer buying has really changed, uh, what we found was, and you put it really well, that leading salespeople, much like the sort of lead steers in a herd of cattle. They, they started pointing in a different direction. They were not told to do that. They were not told to sell differently. They weren't taught or coached 
or trained to do this, they figured it out on their own. They figured out that the customer buying environment had changed in such a way that they needed to change the way they sold accordingly. And, uh, and so in many respects, they were charting the future of what great selling uh, would become. And we just, as you said, we found it with data. and We just gave a name to it. Um, they may not have called what they were doing challenging um, or challenger selling, but that was the name we gave to it. But make no mistake, we didn't invent it. It was something invented by top salespeople who had already figured this out on their own. I mean, it's now perceived to be pretty revolutionary, right? Um, and I think that there's, there's probably a couple of parts to this question. Number one is one of the reasons that it was so talked about is because it almost flouted the fact that it was different to everything else, right? Mm -hmm. So you had solution selling, you had a few other different methodologies that were around. Right. I, I don't know whether you were deliberately being a, a bit of a polemicist in saying like, you know, um, this, is, this is completely different. And I guess the question is, when did you, when you found out that you were onto something, when you found out, actually, do you know what, this is, this is unique and no one's talking about this. At what point did you realize just how different it was, but also how impactful it was on the world of sales? Yeah, it, it's, uh, no, it's a great question. Um, I think that, I think there were a few things that we were um, in, in some respects, I think it's probably a story of better to be lucky than good. And I think we, you know, we stumbled into some of this candidly, um, the, the time was right. Um, there was the occasion, as I talked about before, that that uh, drew us to study um, uh, sales behaviors and what salespeople are doing. We might not have, we were actually heading down a different path right before Lehman Brothers collapsed and the, the, the financial crisis really started to take hold. And so we, we ditched the study we were planning on writing and we ended up writing this study, the Challenger study. And um, it really was, uh, that, that was the sort of lucky part, if you will. I think the world though was ready for um, something different. And the reason I say that is, you know, the world had, the world of sales had long since moved beyond, you know, Neil Rackham, Professor Rackham in the forward to the book talks about the different eras of selling. Uh, and he talks about the evolution, you know, sales, um, the evolution of the hunter farmer model and then product selling in the idea that um, selling is a teachable skill. Um, and then, uh, you know, eventually to his work and the, those of all the, the titans of solution selling and needs diagnosis, which really um, was the, the, if you will, the, the pinnacle of great selling for many, many years, you know, at least until the 1970s, um, when Professor, uh, Professor Rackham and many others um, uh, wrote, did their research and, and wrote a ton of great books. And this is what was practiced for a really long time. And then I think what he saw happening was interesting in our conversations with him, he was kind of waiting for somebody to write the next book, the next chapter in selling. Now, I think he would probably call it, and I would agree with him, more of an evolution than a revolution um, uh, per se. It is building on what great salespeople have done that have gotten them to this point, but it's in recognition of the fact that buying has changed in some pretty fundamental ways. You know, uh, the, the amount of information available to customers today is like nothing we've ever seen. The, I could say the most, there's a, a data point I always share when I present um, challenger to an audience uh, that's actually not in the book and we found it later um, uh, after the book was published where we found and this is one of those um, data points that's been talked about and debated um, uh, quite a bit but we found that the average business customer is almost 60 percent of the way through the purchase journey before they ever pick up the phone and call a salesperson you know we didn't we didn't have the the, the benefit of doing this research back in the 70s or 80s but my suspicion is pre-internet era and before all this information was available, before procurement really became a sophisticated function, before LinkedIn existed and you could get reviews on suppliers and vendors from people like yourself in companies like yours. Before that, there was no other way to learn about your solutions, your products, your services without sitting down and talking to a salesperson. And so uh, Professor Rackham would call that the golden age of the talking brochure salesperson, you know, and, but the internet killed all that. And and, but what was interesting is that sales hadn't really changed. Uh, we were still teaching salespeople that the, the way to sell is to go out and uh, focus on needs diagnosis, to, to ask the customer what's keeping you up at night, and then hope that the customer articulates something that you can attach your value proposition to. What we found is that best salespeople realize in a world where customers can learn on their own, they don't want a salesperson to come in and ask them what's keeping them up at night. 
They want a salesperson who will come in and show them what should be keeping them up at night. Yeah. In other words, what's the insight that they have, uh, a better way to make money or save money or, or avoid risk or a steal market share or engage your customers or your employees in new and different ways that despite all of the research you've done, despite all of the due diligence, despite all of your experience as a buyer, as, a, as a, uh, an executive, as a manager, you missed. Mm. And that's the thing that is still, um, uh, that's the new currency of value. And I think- you know, what was interesting to us as we as we unpack this and, you know, we didn't know it was become, going to become uh, as impactful as it ends up it ended up being and to really change the dialogue. And I think your your question is a good one. We've um, you know, there were other elements, I think, of Challenger, the fact that it was different. I think the fact that it was data based was actually very different. It, Professor Rackham's probably the last book, um, a great study, quantitative, in his case, qualitative study where he actually um, participated in thousands of sales calls and did sort of an ethnographic but but rigorous qualitative study of what best salespeople were doing in those sales calls. You know, in, in the intervening years, 30 years, there hadn't really been a great quantitative study of sales performance. And it's a shame. I mean, I think the, there's so much quantitative research done in areas like marketing, uh, finance, of course, supply chain, product, and uh, there's so much data available in sales, yet there's so much personal opinion. It tends to really permeate the world of sales. And so I think the fact that we came out, we we were not, we didn't profess to be sales experts ourselves. Uh, Brent Adamson and I, and nobody on my sales team had ever been a salesperson. Um, I, as I always tell salespeople, I have a great amount of respect for what they do. It's much easier to write about it than it is to do it. Uh, so, um, but I, I am a researcher by trade. Um, I think. We, we came out, we said we brought data to bear. We took a different approach to study sales. And what we found was that sales has changed and it's changed because customer buying has changed. And a lot of what you're telling your salespeople to go out and do may have worked, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, but it doesn't work anymore. And you need to adapt the way you're doing. So we started to call that insight selling. So if we went from the era of product selling to solution selling, we think we're in this new era of insight selling uh, today. That's interesting. And I'm keen to talk to you about the future of selling because I yeah. think, you, first of all, you've got a lot of experience on, on this from data points, but also we're in a fascinating time at the moment. But there was a question that jumped out to me. And I think the reason it jumped out is because of my personal experience is that I'm a sales trainer, right? So one of the things that I do is I transact knowledge and I transact ideas and I transact methods onto people. But then there's a reliance on them to actually execute on that the right way, or at least keep trying to execute on the right way until they perfect it, right? Yeah. So I guess what what were the detractors saying about this? What the people who weren't yeah. getting it right? What were they saying? Uh, it was uh, it's it's a bit like um, I, in I don't know if you've got this in the UK, but in the in the US at least there's uh, the Baskin Robbins ice cream um, uh, store, which is, prides itself on having 31 flavors of ice cream. Uh, it was sort of like 31 flavors of objection. And I won't go through all of them, but I'll, I'll sort of let me summarize into a few different categories. So the, I think the first one was, um, you know, we got quite a bit of flack actually uh, because about about the fact that we weren't salespeople and we weren't sales leaders. We never carried a bag. We never actually done the job um, and that we were researchers. And so there was some criticism from that perspective. There was criticism around the fact that you know, it, it's, as I said, you know, this was an evolution, not a revolution. I think, you know, we've, we tried to do what we, in our own book and in our own communications, what we talk about in the research, which is to get somebody to the future state, you've got to, so we always talk about the A to B, you're always engaging the customer in their status quo, and you've got to get them to the, to the B state, to the future state. The problem is if the B state sounds pretty similar to the A state, then it begs the question, why change? You know, mm -hmm. is it worth the energy? Is it worth the time? And what we found great challengers do in sales conversations is they really break down the A before they build up the B. They're able to show the customer why the pain of same, the pain of the status quo is actually greater than the pain of change. So you, it's not just that you need to change, you need to do it, have done it yesterday. You know, this is time is of the essence. You've got to move. Um, don't fall victim to the status quo because that is much worse than going down this change journey. And, um, you know, we tried to do that in the book. I remember sitting down with a, an executive who was um, uh, liked the research, uh, thought it painted a, a path for his team um, uh, to sell differently and to be more successful out in the, in the market, but hated the term challenger mm. and that I just don't like the message it sends. And that, I would tell you that's another source of criticism is that, you know, challenger, 
taking control of the sales conversation can come across as a bit rude and aggressive and obnoxious. I always, as you know, there are five profiles that we found in the research. Yeah. Um, and I, I always jokingly say that's the sixth profile, the jerk. We're not talking about that person. We're, you know, challengers are quite empathetic. They're quite professional. They're, uh, they sell within the cultural context, whether I'm selling in another country or to a, a company with a unique cultural context. That's really important. Um, and they're great at building relationships. They just build it in a different way. Um, but we, we realized it. So this, this executive, I remember sitting down with him and he said, I, I love the research. I just hate this word challenger. Why did you guys have to be so provocative? Why didn't you just call it the new relationship builder? Because if you get down to it, that's really what you guys are talking about. You're talking about how the currency of the relationship has changed. Mm -hmm. It's not that we're not being great relationship builders. We are, but we're building a new kind of relationship found on business value. And what I said was, well, if we called the book the new relationship builder, you never would have opened it. Mm -hmm. And he laughed and he said, you know what? You're right. And I said, that's all about breaking down the A and building up the B. So we had to create that, um, that uh, uh, I would call it, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, sort of a cognitive disconnect maybe, or cognitive dissonance between the current state and the future state. And I think that's true for salespeople too. If the sales, if you go in and sell a solution, the customer sees it as just slightly better than what they already do or what they've already got in their in their operation, um, they're going to ask the question, why change? Yeah. And if people had seen Relationship Builder 2.0 or the new Relationship Builder, I don't think it would have had the impact, just even if all the data was exactly the same. I think it was creating that that disconnect or that, that uh, chasm between the challenger and the Relationship Builder, the fact that one did so well and one did so poorly, yeah. and the one who did so poorly, in fact, was really the embodiment of the way that salespeople have been taught to sell for many, many years. The, the relationship builder was the needs diagnosis solution seller, and they finished so far behind. But I think it was that that dissonance that got people to pay attention. The fact that it was database, the fact that it was written by a couple of guys who are not sales experts, um, you know, I think, and, and the fact that the time was right. I think all those things fed into it. But you know, there was quite a bit of flack, and there's no shortage. But I, I'll tell you this: in many respects, you, you know, the old. Um, uh, I'm a fan of um, uh, Escher's work, and there's that famous drawing where it's one hand drawing the other. Yeah. And so it's funny because um, I'll present Challenger oftentimes to audiences, and um, and they come up and they they ask questions about how do I train my salespeople to be challengers? How do I hire challenger salespeople? How do we build challenger insight-based messages? They're asking all these questions about how to do it. And then they ask, well, how do you really know it works? And I said, it works because it just worked on you. That we we pitched the story. That. I created that disconnect. I challenged the way you think about selling, and now you're asking me how you can head down that path, right? And that wasn't that wasn't done for fun. It was in retrospect. It was like, huh, that's an interesting, you know, interesting the way it panned out. But we tried to do that in our writing was really to create that that challenger feel to it, which rubs some people the wrong way. But but it also um, it also got us in. It opened a lot of doors, and many of those people just wanted to tell us we were full of it. But everyone wanted to have a conversation about it. So <laughs> I, I love that. And there's a couple of reasons I love that is because I think, you know, within sales, an objection that someone gives you is often a reflection of themselves. Right. Yeah. And it's really interesting. The people who turn around and go, yeah, but you can't really do that with a client because yeah. it tells you more about themselves than it does about their ability to sell. Yeah. And one thing I, I, I've always stood by, even before your book was written is that challenging a customer in a way that gets them to see things differently is really positive. Like yes. as, and as a buyer, I love that as well, is that yes. it's, 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 it's teaching me something in the process, right? Yeah. But at the same time, it's challenging my own perceptions of things. Doing that in the right way with the right delivery is really, really powerful, but more importantly, credible. And that's what I love about the book in general, but also the methodology. That's, that's what it's designed to do, right? And your, yeah. your example of, of the sales manager saying, I've just done it to you, is perfect, <laughs> absolutely perfect. Okay. I, I did a, um, you know, your point um, is right. It's uh, the, one of the, the disconnects I think are the hardest things for salespeople to get their heads around, especially relationship builder salespeople, um, is this question of, do my customers really want me to challenge them? Do they really want me to teach them new ideas and bring new ideas to them? I did a run of interviews recently for a, um, uh, a global company that's in the medical device space and they sell uh, equipment. Uh, to hospitals, uh, to lab directors, you know, you name it. And I remember talking, they interviewed their customers and they knew when they sent me the list of customers to interview that some of them were being sold to by their, their challenger salespeople and some of them weren't. 
And what was really interesting was the the way that these customers talked about their relationships with, with these salespeople. So the salespeople who um, were being sold to by more relationship builder um, uh, sales folks, sorry, sorry, the customers are being sold to by relationship builders. The way they would talk about their relationships with their sellers was something along the lines of, you know, uh, he's he's very nice. I he checks in with me quite a bit. A lot nice guy. Uh, you know, I don't have any complaints. You know, um, but it was it was like a, it felt like it was fine. You know, mm-hmm. there, there was nothing wrong with the relationship. But it was just fine. But it wasn't adding value. Now those customers I interviewed who were who the company sent to me, who they knew were being sold to by their challenger sellers. The way those customers talked about their relationship and their salesperson was night and day. It was. You know, they would effusively, they would say things like, you know, look, this company sells great products, but their products aren't actually that much better than any other suppliers. The reason I buy from them is because of Susan, because of my salesperson, because she comes in and she is joined to the hip with me. She is a trusted advisor. She comes in with new ideas for my my uh, department, for my lab, for my part of the hospital that changes the way we do things. It's almost like she's not as interested in selling me things as she is in seeing me be successful. Yeah. And you know what? We sometimes have some tense dialogues around what's the right answer for our for our operation. And uh, But those are the things that when she shows me these ideas and we have that intellectual back and forth, it makes me respect her even more. And it really builds a moat around you know, around my hospital, my lab, that's going to make it really hard for anybody else to come in and steal that business, you know, yeah, unless they hired Susan away. So, yeah, and, and, it, and for me, this is this is fascinating. It's also music to my ears because the product or service they're buying is almost a byproduct of the value they're getting in the sales process as well, yeah. right? Like, exactly. and, and, and what I love about the book, and then again, I'm not just here gushing because I think it is great, but this idea of um, this being part of your value is the that's way right. you conduct yourself. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm a believer that there's a, a, mis, a, a, a complete misperception in, in, in selling that the sales rep is obsequious or subservient to the, to the client, right? Yeah. And, and what I love about the message you have is that actually you, you're kind of an equal, but at the same time, you, you're more knowledgeable than them, right? You know, yeah. it's the difference between selling someone a fire engine as opposed to selling them fire retardant curtains, right? If you're selling them yeah. the fire engine once their house is on fire, it's like, well, it's too late now. And what this guy did is they showed me that I didn't need it, right? You know, yeah. this is actually what I needed. And I love that. And I guess the, the, the logical question next um, is, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I, I use a lot of cooking analogies, right? And, and sales is like cooking in the way that if you go back. You know, this is great, Aaron, because I use a lot of eating analogies. So <laughs> okay, great. Well, well, it's going to be a wonderful uh, conference at some point, right, with our, our ideas. But, you know, I believe that environment, technology, and lots of different things affect sales in the same way with food, right? You know, we used to yeah. eat raw meat when we didn't have fire, then we got fire, then we got raw meat, and we yeah. were cooking meat. And now it's the face where you can get like a sous vide steak or like, you know, someone's going to foam some potato onto your plate <laughs> because of the trends, because of the technology, because of the environment. Now, obviously, Challenger, you, you articulated really well at the beginning of our conversation about how Challenger was was perfect for the time because we had this unique environment and this unique effect on the market. And I guess we're kind of going through that with the pandemic, if not exactly yeah. going through that. Yeah. But, but what do you see the next sort of seismic shift being in sales outside of research that you're just doing? It'd be great to get it from your opinion or like a, a preference point of view, really. Yeah, it's a, a great question. So um, I don't have a crystal ball, so this will be uh, as good as anybody else's um, uh, view. But, you know, I, I think that, so a few, a few things I would say, I think that, you know, Challenger, or if, if you will, if you kind of lift up and you say, well, Challenger is a an example of uh, this sort of insight selling kind of movement. Um, and I think since we've written the book, um, there have been a couple of other books out there that are kind of in similar veins where those com- those other uh, sales researchers and consultants have gone out and done their own research and found um, similar similar findings, but maybe it's different at the margins. And so they're adding to the body work, much like, you know, uh, Neil Rackham and, and Matt Hannon and all these, you know, legends of solution selling um, codified that. And then for 30 years, people were adding to it, you know, uh, adding at the, the edges and we got really good at it, right? Um, and I think that's what's going to happen. So I think we're in the really early days is the first thing I would say. I think, I do I think that inside selling will be here with us for the next uh, 30 or 40 years, as long as solution selling? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but the indicators uh, suggest that it will be. And I think one is, uh, there's two big two big problems we've talked about in, um, 
in the challenger research. In the, the original book, as we talked about before, it's this problem of customers learning on their own. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that, you know, your biggest competitor as a salesperson is not the company you think you're competing with. It's your customer's ability to make up their own mind without you there at the table to influence the way they think about not just, not just your company and your value, but how they think about their own opportunities. They, they cement their mental model. And when they contact you really late, you're forced into just, a, they've decided, I've already, I've already decided what to do. I've already decided who should be on my short list. Now all, all I care about is who's going to do it for the least amount of money possible. Who can I really put the screws to in terms of pricing or terms and conditions? And that's a really tough place to be. How do you back that up? How do you earn the right to engage earlier with the customer to, to form their view versus reacting to their view? And um, so I think, you know, look, uh, somebody asked me this the other day. Um, what do I think? How long do I think Challenger will be around? And I said, well, you know, um, as at least it'll be around at least as long as the Internet exists and, and information is abundant. Um, now, I think the other challenge we've written about, and this has gotten actually worse with the, uh, the pandemic. Well, actually, let me, let me say there are two things I think have gotten worse with the pandemic. The first is the bar for what is actually provocative insight. As you know from the book, insight is the tool of the challenger. You know, without something insightful to say that challenges the customer's thinking, you're you're just annoying. You're not challenging, and um, and so it's always been in, incumbent upon the company to build those insights for salespeople. It's not a fair ask of salespeople to say, go out, challenge, and by the way, come up with something to challenge with. That's the job of sales leadership, product marketing, in the company to come up with that. And yes, salespeople speak into that. And they're a great source for raw material there because, again, your best sellers are probably already doing it. But the company's job is to build those insights, codify them, put them into a talk track, in a pitch deck, and then train sellers and coach them on how to deliver those effectively and how to tailor them at the margins. But I think what's happened over the, the intervening years since we wrote the book and today is that the bar for what is provocative insight has really gone up. And mm -hmm. I think part of that is that there's so much noise out there. You know, if you... Um, on the internet, whether it's it's LinkedIn or really anywhere else, I mean, there's just so much thought leadership out there. There's so much, there are infographics, there are factoids, there are webinars, there are white papers, there are LinkedIn live events, there's all kinds of content. And it just, the bar for what's going to cut through the noise in a world where there's so much noise, um, much more than there was 10 years ago, um, has really gone up. And so I think that's one of the things, I wouldn't call it a new way of selling, but I would say uh, we've got to even up our game in terms of producing really hard-hitting, impactful, provocative, frame-breaking insight. I think the other thing that's gotten worse is uh, consensus buying. So that was a, the challenge, if you will, that we wrote about in the sequel, The Challenger Customer. Um, this is something that we've been tracking for the past few years. We wrote a, When we wrote the book, we found the average number of stakeholders in a complex uh, purchase was 5.4. As soon as we wrote the book, we reran the data and we found the number was 6.8. So the book was like already out of date. Mm -hmm. um, my colleagues at Gartner who are continuing to track this found that the, the number is um, north of 20 now. So and if you think about the pandemic environment, I think what really happens, it, it, there was a period last spring, I think, and, and it still exists for certain companies, certain industries, especially like travel and leisure, you know, hospitality and um, the restaurant industry, very hard hit where they're in survival mode. They don't, they're not making any long-term decisions or investments right now. Um, but for the most part, I think companies have moved beyond that. They've started to buy again. They started to make capital uh, investments, hire um, for professional services, et cetera. But the issue is there are twice as many people who are gonna weigh on the, on the decision because companies are so risk averse right now. Yeah. And as we know as salespeople, the likelihood that you know the next person who shows up at the buying committee um, it, that they're going to go along with whatever we've sold and we've gotten buy-in from everyone else, there's a great likelihood that person might raise their hand and say, I object. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should do this. I think we should stay with our current provider. I think we should keep doing this ourselves instead of outsourcing it to this company, whatever the, the solution is. And that's a really tough environment for a salesperson to sell into. So it's really placed a premium on how do we make sure we find the right stakeholder to attach ourselves to, we equip them in the right way because they're really our proxy within their organization. They're, they're the salesperson, they're grabbing the baton from us and they're now their job is to now sell their colleagues mm -hmm. on going with us. And there are gonna be meetings and discussions that as a salesperson, I'll never be invited to. Yeah. Yeah, obviously we aspire to be on the customer side of the table, but let's be honest, those, those conversations often happen behind closed doors and we're not there. And so how do we know we've harnessed the right person on the customer side to forge that consensus? So that was what the second book was about. I, I will say what I'm excited about in terms of selling 
is, in, and I know you said from a research standpoint, um, maybe maybe not so much talk about it from a research standpoint, but I would tell you, I'm excited about the future of being able to study sales in, in new and different ways. So let me explain what I mean by that. We've, um, so for a long time, if you go back to spin selling, uh, Professor Rackham's groundbreaking work, he literally personally listened to um, or attended thousands of sales meetings and took notes, right? He had a um, he had a uh, an interview guide and he was scoring the abilities and taking notes and trying to roll up all this qualitative insight from thousands of sales conversations. Then if you fast forward to um, when we wrote the Challenger Sale, um, what we did, we based that research on a broad-based survey. So we deployed surveys, we asked sales managers to evaluate their sellers, we surveyed customers as well, especially when we wrote the second book, but it was a survey-based um, research approach. Fast forward to today, I think we've gotten out, certainly gotten out of the world of manual listening to calls. We've gotten out of the world of surveying um, in, in doing research based on that. Now with advances in uh, natural language processing, machine learning, we can take actual sales conversations and other unstructured data. So imagine uh, being able to tap into all of the data sitting in our inbox or in CRM or in our calendar. Uh, imagine being tap, being able to tap into data from our content management platform. You know, what, what resources are sellers using? Uh, what, what's leading to uh, success in terms of opening the door or closing a deal with a customer? How are they navigating the purchase process? There is a mountain of data just sitting there waiting to be harnessed to mm -hmm. study, you know, what are best salespeople doing? And we wrote a piece um, just a few weeks ago in, in HBR where we really focused on inbound sales. So this is B2B and B2C, but where customers are calling into place orders. And what is it that the best sellers do to convert those into uh, transactions in the moment? And these folks literally have minutes to get that done before the customer you know, is let off the phone. Um, and so we studied what they're doing and it was really eye-opening some of the behaviors that we found, things that we never could have found with those old research techniques. So I think AI, machine learning, natural language processing is really gonna revolutionize how we understand what best salespeople do. And here's the other thing, and I think especially for folks like yourself, Aaron, in the sales training business, you know, there's always been this question, and you, I'm sure, have uh, encountered this from clients: Did the sales training work or not? Yeah, you know, it, it, right? And and so, the, and then you can look at sales results, and you can say, well, the results got better, but then the customer says, well, sure, but our biggest competitor went out of business, and we launched this new product, and we lowered our price, and we all these other things happened. So, how do we know it was the sales training? And the best we've had to go on for many years was, well. If you look at the evaluations the sellers gave from the sales training, look at all these smiley faces and like, you know, positive reviews, like they loved it, right? So clearly it had some bearing, but it was always hard to connect the dots. I think today we're in a, a brave new world where imagine going in as a trainer, training sellers on a set of skills, uh, techniques that they can use, being able to record their Zoom calls, their, you know, <clears throat> Microsoft Teams interactions, what have you, even their phone interactions, depending on the context, and then mine that data to find out who is using the behaviors and skills that have been trained on. Um, where are there gaps in the organization? Because we all know some people are going to grab onto it right away and some people are, it's going to go in one ear and out the other and they're going to go back to what they were doing before. And what impact is it having so that we can spot the folks who aren't doing it and provide some you know, refresher training or some remedial coaching, if you will. But more to the point, we can really quantify for the client, here is what's happening. When your sellers use these techniques, it leads to bigger deals, better deals, faster cycle times, all the outcomes we care about. And then as somebody whose job is, you know, driving sales transformation like yourself, it lays bare whether what we're doing is having the commercial impact we want uh, in a way that we could never get visibility into it before. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point. And it's, it's something that I speak about a lot because with conversational intelligence tools, and again, this is just my theory, uh, and it'd be interesting to get your perspective on it, is that I think the sales training world is ripe for disruption, but also ripe for being eaten up because I think um, conversation intelligence tools can literally model out, eventually model out best behavior and model out prescriptions on what to do next in real time based yeah. on millions upon millions of data points. Yeah. I think at that stage, um, sales training becomes really clear where the value is because you've got a machine telling you what to do. And I, I think that's the next big shift in sales. I really do. I think that if you take a gong as an example, we're talking about billions of data points. Yeah. All of a sudden yeah. they know what works and what doesn't work, what tone to use. When the customer says this, you should say this, on average, you've got a higher chance of converting because of this. 
Yeah. I think that's the big technological shift in, in sales training. And you'll love that as a, as a researcher, right? I'm guessing. I know, for sure. It's a goal. It's a, it's like, I'm like a kid in a candy shop with, um, with all this data. So, you know, our company at, um, at Tether, we do similar work where we've been focused historically more on B2C, uh, but we're starting to get into the B2B space. And my one, what I've found is, is interesting is that, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the conversational, so the conversational intelligence um, as being deployed out there right now in most companies is really for, um, it's, a, it's sort of a frontline salesperson or sales manager kind of uh, tooling or platform. And a lot of the insights, I think, uh, unfortunately, in its early days, right, but a lot of the insights have been limited to, like you said, kind of basic tonal uh, recommendations or um, you're talking too long, right? You, you're, you need to be talking less than the customer. So what we found is that when you actually, and, and you know, there's always this question of um, correlation versus causality. Yeah. And, but when, when we go and we've gone and we studied some of these conversations, what we found is that there's a wealth of insight in there about the best behavior salespeople are using in uh, in conversations um, that actually are, in many respects, contrary to what a lot of the conversational analytics companies are out there saying. And I think it's in part because they've been selling a tool that is great for a salesperson to go back and listen to a call and understand, did I talk the same percentage of the time as a high performer? Did I use the right tone at key points? Those are all important things, but now you've got this really rich data set and you've got the dependent variable about whether the deal closed or not that you can regress it against. And so I think there's a, a lot more insight we can provide. And then the other thing I would say about it is, you know, it, those insights are valuable for salespeople, but let's think about all the insights that are valuable to product to marketing to sales leadership, right? Or is our product value proposition resonating? If you're a challenger shop and your sellers are using insights, are those insights resonating? How's it, how's the customer responding to those? How do I get the feedback back to marketing whose job it is to create those insights so that they can uh, get them sharper, uh, uh, create more resonance, um, or really just overhaul those insights entirely? So those are the kinds of opportunities, I think, that are more at a leadership level or strategic level that are waiting to be unearthed with conversational analytics. But I, but again, it's early days and it's, um, it's, it is exciting, the potential. So. Yeah, fascinating stuff. It's really interesting to get your take on it, actually. I have one more question for you, and it's sure. it's, it's probably half question, half accusation, actually. <laughs> not, not in a bad way. But, well, I'm being challenging, right? Um, so I, I did a video, which you, which I know you saw and you liked, which was around um, the history of selling. And, yeah. it, and it kind of it, it kind of got me thinking about something, which is, is it because it's different why it works, right? So if you look at um, spin selling, or you know, let's go back to value selling or solution selling, sure. Yeah. came out everyone adopted it everyone started using it customer gets bombarded with the same stuff yeah, yeah and there's yeah. a new iteration customer gets bombarded but it's different right yeah how much do you feel the success of challenger was down to the fact or the success that people have with challenger is yeah. down to the fact that it is completely different yeah to what a customer is expecting when they get a call from a salesperson for sure there is uh, there is some truth to that so i think you know one of the things that um early early companies uh, who again, figured this out long before we wrote the book, like companies like Granger that we profile in the Challenger sale, um, what they realized is that it creates a different feel in the sales meeting if <clears throat> rather than going in and like a solution seller asking the customer, so tell me what's keeping you up at night. What are your objectives? What are you trying to get done this year? And then asking the customer to educate you about their priorities and their needs. Um, they, they chose specifically not to do that because they felt like that's what everyone does and customers, it, it's exhausting to the customer. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing they don't want to do is they don't want to start the sales conversation talking about themselves. And if we look at most sales collateral, you know, the, the first few slides are exactly the same. The first one is your mission and values. The second one is your, your branded product names and logos. The third one is the logos of your best known customers. And the fourth one is like a map of the world with a lot of dots to show how many offices you have. Right. So, and, <laughs> and by the way, you know, it's, it's you know fine, but the customer probably already learned all those things on the website before they met with you, or even before they agreed to give you an hour of their time. So don't don't start a conversation talking about yourself. Start a conversation talking about the customer, but don't do it by asking open-ended questions. So the way they do it, as you know from the book, is um, they they push their reps to create a warmer, which was to sit down with the customer, put pen to paper um, before you meet with them, and take a stab at what do you think the answer to the question what's keeping you up at night would be, but without the customer there to tell you what the answer is. So just take an educated guess based on your read of their press releases and their earnings reports, based on your read of the competitive landscape, based on 
your knowledge of other customers like that customer that you've met with in the past? What would they say? What have they said in the past? And take a stab at it. The goal is not to be 100%, right? That's, that would be presumptuous to think we could totally understand what's going on in the customer's business without ever having met them. Mm. But the goal is to, cre- to create a, to get their shoulders to relax and to get them to feel like, oh, this is a different kind of sales conversation than all the ones I've had in the past. So I think there is some truth to that. There is a lot of differentiation that happens when you engage a customer in more of a challenger way. And I will say, you know, despite um, uh, the number of people who've read it and talk about it, I still think it's pretty rare out there in the in the world of sales. It's not practiced um, uh, very often. Um, the the other thing I would say though is that if you contrast it with solution selling as an approach, where it really is predicated on needs assessment and needs needs diagnosis and open ended questioning, that can sound the same supplier to supplier to supplier. Just it can sound exactly identical and it can be exhausting to the customer. I I jokingly tell a story about a. A, um, a customer I interviewed who said, you know, the thing that's really keeping me up at night is the thought of the next salesperson who comes in and asks me what's keeping me up at night. You know, that, <laughs> that's really what bugs me um, and what has me worried. But if you think about Challenger, remember, the, there's Challenger is a set of salesperson skills, but it's also an organizational capability. So you've got to have that insight with which to challenge. Yeah. By definition, that insight, uh, as we talked about, it leads to what makes your company unique. So, so then by definition, if it makes your company unique and the insight is the thing that, that reframes the customers thinking about their business in a way that gets them to want to pay for what makes you unique, then that insight is different for every single company out there. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, while some of those behaviors and those skills, those challenger behaviors and skills could start to feel more like, I, oh, I, I sense what you're doing, right? Because I saw it from the salesperson I met with last week, but the insight itself has to be different because it's it's only specific to your company, at least if you do it the right way. And so there'll always be a, an element that is different, um, uh, you know, company to company, even if they're all practicing challenge or selling. Awesome. Well, if people want to get in touch with you or people want to see your work or if people want to buy any of your books, what's the best place? Yeah, so I, I'm happy to, uh, I think the best place is LinkedIn, honestly. Um, uh, let me know you heard me on the on this interview um, and uh, send me a note um, and love to be connected with you. And, and otherwise, uh, you can connect uh, with me at uh, my company, which is uh, Tether. Again, we're in the conversational analytics space. Uh, it's tether.com because we're a startup. We don't spell it the right way. So it's T-E-T-H-R dot com. And you'll learn a little bit more about our research. I mentioned that um, uh, that recent HBR study we put out. Uh, about what we're looking at, we're looking at inbound selling behavior. So happy to shoot you a copy of that. And um, we've got a whole five part kind of podcast series where we unpack that research in more detail that that your listeners might be interested in. So cool. I'll make sure I put all the links in the video on YouTube. So cool. like, just finish by saying, look, it's been a really enjoyable conversation. Like uh, yeah, thanks, sir. it's uh, it's it's great to have you here and obviously learn about the history, but more importantly, get some of that great insight around where things are moving. So thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. I appreciate the invite.